Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Okay. Which was small and had a few factories. Quaker Oats was there, Iowa Manufacturing. And my father um, was worked, and his father started a factory, and he worked there as uh, vice president of an office equipment factory, which I enjoyed going to when I was young to see the big machinery. He, they built beautiful, ornate safes. But he also um, made paper tablets, and there were bins at the ends of paper tablets that we could go into and choose whatever we wanted for drawing. <laughs> and my grandparents had a farm nearby in Bertram, and my sister and brother and I spent, brothers and I spent um, a lot of time on the farm, which was wonderful. Artist who lived in Cedar Rapids, and when I was, he had a gallery, the only one that I knew of, near the public library, and we walked all over the town. Um, and I remember being fascinated and going in and talking to him about his art and painting. He was very sweet. And then I, uh, I guess, I went to college in Colorado Springs at Colorado College and took all the art courses that I could from basic design, which I got an F in because I did not um, do the toothpick projects and that sort of thing very well. It had a wonderful art head of the art uh, department. His name was Arnold um, Arnest, Bernard Arnest. And he would go to New York and come back and describing pop art, the, first the, uh, the expressionist, the abstract expressionist, and then the new thing of pop art it was all really interesting, teaching us to paint and to be free, pretty free, rather than following rules or, or having to draw um, realistically. I, I don't remember what I was doing. I went to Boston University when I was a junior. I got a sort of scholarship and went there and studied with M M Walter Murch and Conger Metcalf and there did sort of academic work, studied anatomy, perspective, painting eggs. We painted eggs for a semester in Conger Metcalf's class, drew them and then painted and I enjoyed it because it was sort of the opposite of the complete freedom in the other school. And then I became very influenced by Fairfield Porter marrying his, his brother's son, um, Elliot Porter's son Stephen. I married when I came back from Boston University. Oh, he was a sculptor and he loved Brancusi. By that time, uh, I'd been in Boston and at the museum and seen some contemporary art there. And all of that was wonderful, and eye-opening eye and great. And then being in the Porter family was an even bigger education, because they knew many artists, some writers. And Aline Porter, um, Elliot's wife, Stephen's mother, was a very beautiful painter. And she showed at Betty Parsons, and I met Betty Parsons, who was one of her best friends, and went to New York and saw art. I applied to Cornell, and we moved to Ithaca, where he was, where we were for four years, I think. And I started teaching grade school there, and worked in. Um, an upholstery factory, a small upholstery factory, sewing naga hide. And also, I, had, <laughs> I went to an employment agency and they said, we don't have a teaching job right now, but we have something you think, we think you'll like. And it was the late shift at the bowling alley. <laughs> but um, I did, but I liked all the jobs I had. And I had no desire to be in school myself. And then I finally did get as a job uh, teaching grade school the last year or two that we were in Ithaca. And I loved that, and I taught after that.
ever, uh, ever after that. When I moved by myself to Boston in 1967, I started teaching immediately and worked in a place called the Storefront Learning Center that Jonathan Kozal, who wrote books on the education of poor urban children, um, started with um, a couple of parents and me. It was in the same building that I rented a studio space in, and the Storefront Learning Center occupied the first floor. And it was owned by a community uh, furniture store. There, there was so much community action at that time, in the late 60s. It was, it was inspiring and wonderful. I taught in a Quaker school for several years in Cambridge. And I was, I, I was always painting this studio in the south end of Boston, which was mostly black and Puerto Rican and a few gypsy families. Um, a lot of artists had studio space in these big warehouses, unheated, but we just wore sweaters and gloves. And I started doing really big paintings there in Ithaca. I, I did some fairly large paintings which were the beginning of my interest in geometrical abstraction, I guess. And all of those went into a dumpster, which is where they belonged. But in Boston, I started making some big paintings, like, you know, eight, nine, ten feet long, that um, I still think were, are good. And there was a whole community of artists, ser my age, serious artists working. And then I was lucky and had a gallery there, obelisk, and two of my best friends were dealers and a lot of fun, Joan Sodomen and Phyllis Rosen. Phyllis was my best friend. Um, and then I had a show at MIT, and from there, um, Phyllis and Joan worked very hard to get David McKee interested in New York. And I showed with David McKee for several years in New York from 1974 on. In 1972, I got an NEA, thanks again to the effort of my friends, dealer friends, and moved to New Mexico from 72 to 76 and continued painting big paintings and loving every minute of being in New Mexico. During the time that I was with Stephen Porter, um, we went with Elliot to um, the Galapagos, to Baja on jeep trips, and uh, amazing experiences to see the Galapagos before many people went. And then Glen Canyon also before it was flooded, I mean, two trips. One of them, O'Keefe was on the raft trip. And that was, she was very interesting and funny, and I got to know her because she and the Porters were good friends. And when I moved back out there on my own in uh, 72, I went to see her a few times. Um, she, was, she was amazing. I, I, I loved her, who she was, but I did not love her paintings. I admired them, but, and the scale of them was beautiful to see. Uh, and when did I start to go to Europe? Uh, I guess I went with my friend Paul Haru, who's a potter here in Maine. He lives in um, New Gloucester. He, he did those. He's a great potter. I'm sure you know his work. We went to Florence and Deruda to see pottery and the art there. That might have been my first trip to Europe, and that was in the... Uh, mid-70s, I guess. And then in the 80s, I started going to France and went as often as I could every year or every other year and became friends with an artist in Provence and his whole family, his mother, his brothers, his father who was a poet. Um, and I've tried to go every year for a while. I've never lived there. I think six weeks is the longest I've stayed at a time. And then when I was married to my second husband, Mark, we married in the mid-80s. Um, 
and we went to South America. He had a cousin, Sally, who lived in Buenos Aires and in um, Maldonado, um, Uruguay, which I loved. Um, and Montevideo was my, my favorite city, even more than Paris in the world, an old, sort of decaying, but beautiful, lively, colonial city. Travels, did they, how do you think that influenced your subject matter or painting style? Oh, or? Hugely, hugely. The color, the architecture, the old colonial architecture, and then in France, especially, Romanesque and Gothic architecture. It's been a big influence. And what I care most about, I think, is that is Romanesque, is um, the 12th century to the 19th century. Did you get? Did you have a period where you were more figurative? Early, I was very influenced by Fairfield and Matisse. And behind you is a copy of a Bonard from a book. I needed to study color, and who better than Bonnard, which is also a first major love for my whole life. I, I got an NEA and stayed in New Mexico till 76, and then I moved to Maine in 76 to Belfast. And was there a lively artist community in Belfast at that There point? were a lot of people my age who were doing all kinds of things. A beautiful photographer, Richard Norton, who died way too young. And um, I met Rudy Burkhart through Neil Oliver. I lived on the same road as Neil, and we became friends. And I met um, Alex Katz and uh, Rackstraw Downs, but I was really good friends with Rudy and a little less extent with Yvonne um, Jacquette. But I liked all those artists, Bob Brooks, Janice Casper, who's a beautiful artist who lives in Swanville. Oh, I love Burn Porter, thank you, yes. I love Burn Porter. What a great iconoclastic genius I think he was. Mm -hmm. I used to go see him, and once in New York, there was somebody rang my bell. I, was, I, I, I taught in New York. I, ta I taught all of my life until 1992, um, or 2002, 2002, I get these decades mixed up. And um, I rented um, lofts in New York for a semester for four or five months every year, because I lived mainly here in Maine. And one day um, my doorbell rang and I went down and it was burned with a paper bag. He was just back from Europe. So that was nice. Did you uh, have any association with the other, some of the other members of the, Un the Union of Maine Visual Artists at that time? or mm -hmm. Not Carlo Pittori? Or? Oh yes, Carlo, because of his interest in Bern, yes. Uh -huh. He was a strange, wonderful person, too. But I think Bern was an absolute genius. But in 1980, uh, maybe, um, a, a double hardware store in downtown Belfast and had the second floor of one made into a really sweet living space and had big studio spaces on the two ground floors. One of them I used for kids from the neighborhood, the children of people who worked in the fish factory and the chicken factory who were on the street and they were always around and I made set up sort of funny window displays or settings for their amusement. And um, I went to Virginia. I just sort of picked any spot out and moved to a small town near Charlottesville, Virginia. And ended up in an old mill, which I sort of fixed up, but it flooded regularly. Every time there was a big rain, because it was very close to the James River. And the mill stream behind my mill went right into the James, like a block away a dirt, a short dirt road, but people there were incredible in the country, I loved them. Um, yeah, I was um, showing at McKee and then Emmerich in New York, yeah. 
And then in 1996, I moved to Montreal. I'd been gone there as a tourist early in the 90s and loved it. And because of the flooding in the mill, I couldn't stay. I had to get rid of it, sell it. And um, moved to Montreal and was there for nine years, Nova Scotia for 10 years, which was my favorite. Well, I loved all the periods in my life, but that was, I loved that. I loved that city and had incredible friends, artists, writers, just neighborhood people. It was a, it's a beautiful city for, for life with other people, like Europe. I built a cabin in Nova Scotia. Mm -hmm. First I bought a little house and spent every summer five months in Nova Scotia. And again, amazing people there. And painted um, really well in Nova Scotia. Big paintings which were shown in New York um, often. In Montreal I had a hard time painting. Um, uh, because the city and my friends were so interesting. <laughs> Is there a woodcut behind me? Okay. This was from Montreal? Montreal, yeah. In the late 90s or early 2000. I, I left there in 2004 because I got really sick, which is a, t a stupid reason to leave Canada. I had my papers and everything. But I wanted to, I thought I was not going to make it, so I wanted to be near my family. And moved to Maine because of the ferry. Um, I could still continue to go to Nova Scotia because oh. there was a Portland ferry, which went out immediately after I, le I moved there. I went quite out, and I think it, it worked just, you know, very quick work there. Usually when you do that, you end up repainting the whole painting. But that painting to me is about COVID. About what it's doing inside and outside in the world. In my world, too. Yeah. I've taught everywhere? I've taught in many places. Uh, in fact, since I started teaching in the late 60s, there I, I haven't missed a year. First children and then in um, colleges. I taught at my mass art in, I don't remember, sometime in the early 70s. And then I've taught at Penn. Neil got me a job and I was there for many years. At Tyler, this is all as visiting artist for one semester a year. Either every, you teach once or twice a week or you just make regular visits to France. And when I got back, Notre Dame burned. So I, so I changed the painting, of course. I don't know, it's just personal. To me, that was just the most horrible thing. But you say you've been working in small yeah, drawings? Yeah, really small. Or? They're just, they're pleasurable. I don't have to use, I don't think much when I'm doing them. And they're pastels? Or they're red? watercolor yeah, water. and colored pencil. Uh-huh. Mm. Beautiful color. They're, yeah, they're color studies and they're, they're decorative. It's always good to have a pootie in your life. <laughs> uh, music is influencing your... Yeah, I'm, I've often been aware of that and listen to classical music and carefully choose it from the whole range, from, from Palestrina up to Exenakis. The, the movement in a painting that matters, the way, if there's not something that moves, if it's static, um, it, it doesn't work and I don't keep the painting as it is. Mm -hmm. When I was on Vinyl Haven, I had a wonderful friend, Andre Rocks, who was a Romanian sculptor who had been the head of sculpture at Columbia for years and years. He built his own house. He was, he was like a new Brancusi. He did carved stone and wood things. But I remember him coming once over to my place and looking at pictures 
and saying it, it, something about it being static. And that was the first time that I gave that, you know, clear thought what that was and why a painting didn't work for me, and that was often why. Just, just, it didn't move. It was like a stage set, nothing happening. Mm -hmm. oh. So what do you do to push that aside? You rethink what you're doing and look at it and just make it move. It's a matter of drawing. And what are the other influences when you're actually in the studio? Oh, I look at art all the time, from, from ancient art, Assyrian art, to contemporaries. And something, you know, in all of it is in my head and is influential. But I'm never not looking, especially at art. I mean, it's important to be in nature. But it's not nature that's the basis for me of what I'm doing. It's more music and um, an abstract kind of movement and references to the past, either abstract or not. So, <clears throat> of all the artists that you have known, I'm sure a lot of them will crit you invite to critique your work, or you no? You make studio visits with each other. Jake Berto is one of the artists that is, has been the biggest in my life since the 70s, in my head. Um, I, lo I love his work, and he was in Belfast for a while, and we would go to each other's studios. It was really nice. And, and Alex Katz came a couple of times in New York, and he said things that were valuable, critical and valuable. But often do you just turn your head and say, I'm going to do it my way. Yeah, what the hell does he know? <laughs> and then you, I realized, you know, days or weeks later, yeah. <laughs> and you said, how how your life would be empty if you stopped painting? Yes, if, I, if I'm if i not working, then I, I just feel like a, a sort of unmoored, crazy person. And get fixated on little household details or whatever. I should be doing woodcuts and things with tools that are more physical. And... Um, I haven't done that for a while. I made clay things for, for a long time, reliefs, glazed reliefs, when I was in Portland and then a short time in Madison. And I like the physical thing of either doing something with wood or clay, whatever. <laughs>